What if our government had the power to send children away from their families to an institution where they would be indoctrinated into a new culture that wasn't their own? With a new language, clothing, customs, forced to give up the identity they were born with. And there was a very immediate, often quite harsh, physical processing. Removing what folks called their home clothes, being issued GI, government issue uniforms, being scrubbed within an inch of your life. If this were to happen today, public outrage would be swift and ferocious. But for several generations of Native Americans, that was the reality in the late 19th and mid 20th centuries. And there was no public outcry. The voices of American Indians weren't heard. This was the boarding school era with the infamous slogan, kill the Indian, save the man. The whole boarding school generation has so many different stories and you'll have people that are forthcoming with talking about it and others who don't want to talk about it at all. It's been swept under the rug for many, many years. And it's time that it be told, the truth be told, not what you read in the history books. I was seven when I went to school. My mother dropped me off there and I didn't know where she went. So I went looking for her and I couldn't find her. I don't know what prison's like, but it was just like you were a prison. The first two weeks of school, being away from home for the first time, was the worst time in my life. They took me to this room and said this was my place. And that night when I went to sleep, I cried for two weeks for my mother. And I heard the train. I heard the train whistle blowing. And to this day, every time I hear a train, I think of that night, and it still makes me lonesome. And they're trying to make, make you over to somebody that you can never be. No matter how, how hard they try, no matter what they do, you're still gonna be who you are. And it's in your heart, it's in your blood. By all accounts, the Native American boarding school era was a complete failure in U.S. Indian policy and a horrific, even shameful time in American history. Stories of abuse, humiliation, even death are all part of the boarding school narrative. There is no question the goal of the U.S. government was to destroy tribal culture and communities, to annihilate the remains of tribal identity. The purpose of the federal policies of assimilation at that time were to be a, quote, pulverizing engine that would smash tribalism in all of its forms. The U.S. government, their goals were the same as they always were when it came to federal Indian policy. It's to assimilate Indian people into the greater society. By exerting power and control over tribal governments, and then breaking up the land mass. In Oklahoma, it was called allotment. Well, U.S. Indian relations always boils down to land. It's always about land. This nation was built and thrives today on Indian land. The dispossession of tribal land was only one aspect of the federal policies that worked to tear down tribal communities. A national effort to destroy native culture was part of the strategy as well. Culture, religion, language, belief systems in property ownership, every single aspect of the way you lived your life was part of the subject matter of the assimilation policies. But I think also assimilation implies that once you acculturate, you're gonna be welcomed into the larger US society on an equal playing field. That part, I don't buy. That part of assimilation, I think, is actually a lie. This was a dark time in American Indian history, a full-on attack on tribal identity and culture. And during that time, the Native American population decreased 
significantly. And that's as a direct result of the policies of the time. From removal to the Indian Wars to the strict assimilation policies of the 1880s and 1890s. And so the boarding school experience became one of the most defining Indian experiences of the 20th century. With a military background, Richard Henry Pratt founded the first off-reservation boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He envisioned a strict military-style immersion into a white American culture for Native American children, where children, some as young as five years old, were sent away from their families, sometimes without seeing them again for years. Well, Richard Henry Pratt was a very interesting man. In some ways, very much a man of his time. I would say he did not think there was any place in the present or future for vital, dynamic tribal societies. He is the man who coined the phrase, kill the Indian, save the man. So Carlisle was established in 1879. By 1884, you get the other, the really big flagship schools, Genoa in Nebraska, Shalako in Oklahoma, may have had good intentions, but many of the schools like Carlisle also had a very negative effect on Native culture. And the stories that have come out of the boarding schools over the years and the boarding school generation are very often, all too often, stories of abuse and neglect and forced cultural change. Those stories from across the country a background and context for a uniquely different Chickasaw story playing out in Indian Territory. For the Chickasaw, I would say, uh, for the most part, the people that I interviewed and the history that we know about the boarding schools was um, a whole lot better than, say, some tribes uh, from out west or up north experienced. And to understand how and why the Chickasaw experience during the boarding school era was different, we must first go back to the homelands. Before Oklahoma statehood, before assimilation, before removal, to a much earlier time when Chickasaw leaders saw a storm of change on the horizon. And so even before removal, seeing what way things were going, seeing the rapid, the crazy changes that were happening so quickly in the young United States. Chickasaws reached out for education, realizing that they were going to need to know how to speak a different language. By 1799, Presbyterians, Methodists, and to a lesser extent Baptists, came into the Chickasaw homelands with a mission. They requested from the council to be allowed to put into place a missionary school. And while they were there, of course, the missionaries wanted a lot of it to be based around Christianity. Chickasaws actually liked the idea of the different types of schools that were uh, brought into the homelands. At that time, they saw education as a way to compete. And the schools posed no threat to their culture or way of life. The goal of the schools was to add to the Chickasaw body of knowledge, not to obliterate it, how to get along in this new world and protect their boundaries, protect their people, and make their way in this world. With education, they had a better opportunity to negotiate and to deal on a government-to-government -government basis with the federal government. So it worked out well, but then you had the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Removal from the homelands into Indian territory meant starting over, rebuilding lives and communities from the ground up. And then once we came into Indian territory, um, we did immediately write into our laws and provide for schools in the Chickasaw Nation. And I've always thought, what a tremendous act of of hope that one of the first things Chickasaws did in our first written laws in Indian Territory was to establish a school system. We still got there and we imagined not that the world had ended, but that there was a future and a Chickasaw future for Chickasaw people in a Chickasaw nation. Those schools 
you know, flourished. And uh, Chickasaw families embraced that for the most part. Among those was Bloomfield Academy, Bernie Institute, which we're in today. Also, there was the Chickasaw Manual Labor Academy for young males. During Civil War times, those schools shut down. If they weren't being burned down or blown up, they were being used as, as military barracks and, or military installations. So Bloomfield at that point became a hospital. The other schools were in a sort of a period of chaos and everything kind of ended. But post-Civil War, out of the chaos, back came the schools again, but this time differently. This time, Chickasaws took complete control over curriculum and teachers. Schools were established within the major towns of the Chickasaw Nation. At Bloomfield, the focus was on art and music and drama. It was more of a finishing school for women, where students were known as the Bloomfield Blossoms. And again, there was always this language of we must be able to compete, we must be able to compete. But the fact that the Chickasaws, unlike other tribes, were able to have their own boarding schools and have control over what was going into the minds of their youth, more so than some of the other boarding schools. This was the golden age of education for the Chickasaw Nation. But the U.S. government had plans that would again revolve around taking control of tribal self-determination. Now, at the turn of the century, with Oklahoma statehood, again, you're in the middle of the strictest assimilation policies that the United States um, had to offer. Now, we've been here in this little almost protected place in the center of the country of Indian Territory. What was happening during the same time period to tribes across the country? This was the period of the Indian Wars. This was the period of some tribes being chased across the plains and then corralled onto reservations where they were not even allowed to be able to leave. It's remarkable. That's not something that we were a part of at that time. We were as autonomous as a tribe could be during that time in our own nation with our own laws and doing our own thing, exercising sovereignty and self-governance. That was sadly not the case for so many tribes across the country. But Oklahoma statehood would herald monumental change for the Chickasaw people. And the boarding schools are taken over down to every last pencil and piece of paper in them and put to other purposes, turn into other things, with the exception for the Chickasaw Nation of Bloomfield. It was the only of the Chickasaw boarding schools that remained open after Oklahoma statehood. The rest of them were closed. So when the boarding schools were taken over by the state of Oklahoma with Oklahoma statehood in 1907, this was quite a blow. The emphasis was a bare essentials education to learn skills to assimilate into white society. And the students had to spend substantial time working, manual labor, to maintain the schools. They really were fabricated, designed on the assumption that we're gonna train these native people, native children, young adults, to be subjects, to be compliant with federal control, to do as they're told, and to work at this very low laboring level. And the detail work was everything, scrubbing the floors, working in the cafeteria, working in the school frequently grew its own food, so in the orchards or milking the cows. At Sequoia, we went to school, actual education, three R's for half a day, and we did a vocation the second half of the day. And I learned to sew, I learned to weave, I learned to take care of a cafeteria. I learned to cook, although for 300. And I've made so many pink flannel nightgowns. I sleep in pajamas now. All of the work of the school then done by the students. And it was just a whole different thing. But it just changed your whole life when you went there. You just weren't who you were anymore. Make you feel bad about who you are. A lot of that can be internalized 
and that can be very, very damaging. And all the different students at these schools responded to things differently, and some internalized those structures, and others resisted and fought against it. Miss Watkins said, you have got to go, you have got to go now and get on the bus. And so our mother took us out there and put us on the bus. And, and my sister was younger than me. And so she was crying. And so we waved at mom till we couldn't see her anymore. She was crying. She was crying real hard. It was hard for her. It was awful. I didn't, I knew I would be back home at some point, but that didn't help me at the moment. It was, I've lost my parents, my husband, a son, and those two weeks were worse than that. Most Chickasaw children were not ripped from their families, as was done to some of the Western tribes. But for many Chickasaw parents, the schools were a means to survive for their children to eat. And at the time of statehood, all of Indian Territory was frankly divested of its property and thrown into poverty. So the situation for people had changed dramatically. Well, I was thinking about my, my grandparents, you know, because they were the ones that raised me and they was having a hard time. And I was trying to ease some of the burden I said, it'd probably be better for me just to go on to like a boarding school. After I got there, sometime I was wishing I'd just stayed home. My father had already told me, he said, uh, uh, the government is coming to pick y'all up. They said, y'all need to be in school and be taken care of right. So early one morning, about five or six o'clock, the government, black government car rolled up. And we, we had to get up, and some of them still rubbing their eyes, and we got our little belongings and got in that long black car, and uh, we were sent to government school at Goodland Indian Orphanage near Hugo, Oklahoma. So I was probably about 12 or 13 that year. So Shalaka was my dad's childhood. 14, 15, he just could not stand it anymore, so he ran away. Chickasaw children were thrust into an institutional system with strict schedules and harsh discipline, an environment that felt foreign. So this gets right at the heart of the questions, why did Indian children go to federal schools? Certainly that we, we know the stories of children who were taken by force police force, children like my dad and his brother who were placed by court order. But there was also a lot of voluntary enrollment. In the 1920s, the Depression era and the period of the federal control of the school, well then you have, here is a place of food security and a place where you'll know what you have and where you will not be hungry. And that is a powerful, powerful thing. So people could quite literally not put food on the table. They could not feed their children. She didn't want me to go, but she had no choice. Molly Perry remembers the day she had to say goodbye to her mother, but the details of that day are best pushed away. I have blocked that out. It was a bad day. And then my brother, at that time, they could flog kids, and I heard, I heard through the grapevine that they really did give him a beating with a paddle, with a stick. And then it, it wasn't very long. My brother didn't stay there. He ran off. I used to ask Grandma if I could quit school. And she said, no, you need it. She said, you know, you're going to need it in life. But she said, you're going to be in two different worlds. as a means to assimilate young Indian children. Separation from family and community supported the goal to erase their way of life. 
you effectively take them out of their culture. You have to eradicate the language in order to do that. And so a big part of the boarding school experience was to learn English and not to use uh, your tribal language. They actually spanked the little ones if they were not speaking English. No, if we spoke our language, we'd either get a spanking and told we couldn't talk it anymore. I think one thing you really lose when you're in Indian school, which I lost too, was the mere fact of a touch, a hug, a real sincere feeling of love. And then you lose that after a certain period of time. And it takes a long time to get it back. And it affects you the rest of your life. In the 1920s, this Merriam survey team went all over the U.S., Indian country. They told Indian people, we're here to find out what's going on. Just tell us what's on your mind. And boy, Indian people did. And what comes out of those transcripts again and again and again is Indian people saying, we want to have a voice in what happens in our community. You're stripping out our resources our wealth is vanishing before our eyes. We want a voice. I don't think that message has changed a lot. Human beings want self-determination. The Jigsaw story to me is interesting because it starts off one way, it merges with a different narrative, but ultimately it takes education, which was at that time a tool of assimilation and instead uses it as a tool of cultural preservation. I think it improved the way that we lived in our future because we had lived in two different worlds. One was the Chickasaw world and one was the English world. So we had to mix them together to blend in to be able to survive in our world now. The schools achieved what federal policymakers had defined as their goals to break down a sense of Native identity. And sometimes it went just the opposite direction. So I, I think the schools were, in fact, very instrumental in forging a, a more kind of national Native identity. People are also resilient, and they make family and the schools, again, ultimately reinforced a sense of American Indian identity that students then went out and reorganized their tribal governments. Was the school a good thing or a bad thing? It was both. Because people are complicated and more than one kind of experience is possible. How do human beings survive? They have these wellsprings of strength and Native societies have provided that wellspring. And then we have to recognize those individuals who did not survive boarding schools. That's a terrible legacy. These stories are important. And they're not just important to document, oh, bad things happened to Indians. They're important to document we survived them. We were creative, we were dynamic, we were intelligent, we were tough. We had, as children, great happy times in a harsh and unforgiving environment. We made something out of that place that it was never intended to be. That deserves honor.